Hey guys, this is Adwukta. Welcome to the Kabolds and Catacombs Arena Meta Preview. Um, here at the Grinning Goat, we do a lot of Hearthstone Arena content. This YouTube channel you're watching here, Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash Grinning Goat, which is our, uh, our Twitch account, and uh, a Lightforge podcast, as well as a Lightforge tier list, which will, it's currently being worked on right now to update for the new expansion, and it will have every single card on day zero, as usual, uh, so on Thursday, all that will be here. This is not about that. I know if you guys watch us, uh, watch us through other expansions, you know that since TGT, God, that's a long time, uh, me and Murps have done a stream where we value every single card. Uh, we talk about their design, we talk about their impact in the arena, we talk about their value, like we give it a number. And we're not doing that this year uh, on video format because the timing got a little tight, and that's why Murps is also not here right now. But we could do this, we're fine, you know. He's only the number one arena player uh, in July. We, we, don't, we don't need that. Uh, we'll, we'll go over all the themes, and if you're wondering um, how we go through all the themes, well... Arena, as opposed to Constructed, is, is very formulaic. Um, you don't just get one deck that becomes really good, and then everyone plays it, and then the counter decks become good, and then new deck archetypes form. It's kind of impossible to predict which cards are really going to see the most play. And so you have these videos come up where the Constructed players are getting all these things wrong. Uh, but in the Arena, it's pretty straightforward. I don't think we're doing anything like rocket science here. Like, this is, this is all just math. Um, and predictions, but pretty safe predictions. And we go through this every year and we say like meta's gonna slow down, meta's going to speed up, there's gonna be more taunts, board's going to get more messy. Um, you know, sometimes like watch out for these things, they're introducing this new thing, this is what death knights mean and how you should defeat them, which not enough people listen to the Light Forge on that because people apparently were not defeating the death knights and they had to take them out of the arena. Um, but this is, this is where you find out that kind of information. And believe me, there are ways to play around just about everything, and there are ways to extract value from just about everything, right? Like, even in the Death Knights craze, I keep saying, like, me and Murphs maintained above a 70% win rate against Death Knights. That we saw. So the Death Knights trapped in people's hands that, you know, they've lost the game already and they never play it. Like, we don't even know about. Um, and these are all things that are possible by just looking at how the arena works and having a very good grasp of the tempo and the expectations of what goes on in the arena. So this is what we do here at the Grinning Goat. And uh, just because we're not going through this card by card, this expansion, doesn't mean we're not going to talk about the big themes. Um, and these, these themes are like, uh, just to give you an example. Um, back in KFT, when we were doing the reviews, we said the two-drop curve is going to get more a little more messy, which didn't happen as badly as we thought it was going to happen because the offering bonus that Blizzard gave us was wrong, and I'll talk about that afterwards. So um, I guess that's a miss, but that's literally because Blizzard was giving us wrong information. Uh, we said the synergy picks are going to make things awful, and all that happened. Um, could not... <laughs> uh, could not... Could not have predicted that in a in a more uh, more precise way, um, and we talked about how important it was to be on the board and to need the board and to reward the board. Right, the key phrase that we said repeatedly in that video, and you can go watch it now, is reward the board, and that's what happened in KFT. You were always rewarded for being on the board because of all the buffs and neutrals. Um, so. Those are examples of, of the kinds of metas we're going in. We are now leaving the KFT meta. We are now no longer going to reward the board. And instead, we're going to do some of the other things. And here are the other things. They're on the agenda up here. Three drop dominance, taunts and heals. <laughs> okay, I titled that avoid and fun. I'll tell you what that means when we get there. But that's probably the most important one. Uh, swings and RNG, which is coming back in a big way. And finally, class divergence. A lot of class convergence was happening in KFT with all the big neutrals, and now we're spreading them out a bit, which is a good thing. So we'll, we'll get to all of those. Um, but to kick things off, the first thing I do every time I see all the card dumps and all the cards, by the way, only three neutral common cards were revealed out of like, like they revealed like what, 65, 70% of the cards in this expansion before the, uh, the card dump time on Monday. And then on Monday, Every single neutral card was released, especially the common ones. Um, and there's a reason for that, and we'll, we'll get to that later. But as soon as I see these neutral cards, I try to build the curve. I try to see how the curve is adjusted by the amount of cards that are offered in the arena, because it's the arena. You only get offered three cards. You don't get to just say, I want four three drops and five four drops. 
you don't get that. Blizzard tells you how many three drops and two drops and four drops you get. So because arena is often defined by the curve, right? It used to be curve stone, it's a little less curve stone now. This is, this is a very important thing. And Blizzard, I don't know if they're intentionally doing this for the arena or if they just want this to happen to, uh, to construct it too, or if they're just running out of ideas, but they've had this consistent theme since MSG of just not printing two drops. Like, and I'll show you what I mean, right? Um, here are the numbers, like just to, to give you the numbers right, uh, right off the bat. I have them somewhere here. Uh, there are, okay, maybe I don't have them as handy as I thought that I had them, but there were basically one, there was basically one. Yeah, there's exactly one on curve two drop in MSG. There were a bunch of Angoro as they built the curve up again. But then KFT came along, and there was one. And then, now, we're entering into Cabals and Catacombs, and guess how many neutral two drops there are? And I'm not just talking about neutral common two drops. I'm including, like, neutral rare two drops and epic two drops. Just neutrals. Because a neutral will appear in every single class, so it'll appear, like, nine times more frequently than, uh, <clears throat> than, than a two drop that's in a class. Well, not nine, like 4.5 times. Because classes have an offering bonus of uh, roughly double, uh, assuming they're applying it right. So the two drop we had in MSG, I'm sure you guys all remember this if you played the arena back then, is Friendly Bartender. And you remember this guy for the reason, and this is going to be the big part, uh, this is going to be the part I'm going to come back to. The reason you remember this guy and not potentially other two drops is because he was the only two drop and he had an offering bonus. And so you just saw him everywhere, and every single game had a friendly bartender. And if you look at win rates, you'll quickly realize that when there are spare of sparse two drops, the people that win are the people that take the two drops, are the people that are not swayed by like the ridiculous value and take like eight, seven drops, and instead know what a curve is and know that you have to fill a curve, and so you'll have to like dip on value to get your two drops. And that one was just offered the, uh, the most. So very, very high win rate card, friendly bartender. We're going to skip on Goro for a second because they actually had plenty of two drops there, so it wasn't as applicable. Once again, Tuscar Fisherman, you look at HS replay stats, and these don't look like insanely good cards, right? Like, Friendly Bartender kills one per turn, it's alive. It only has three health. It's not going to live that long. Like, Tuscar Fisherman gives plus one spell damage sometimes. Like, these are not the most amazing cards, but their win rates almost rival, like, very premium cards. Like, not quite Bone Marrow level, but... Probably stuff like like cards that you would think are much better, right? Like Frozen Crushers or like Big Time Racketeers or like Bog Creepers. Like really good cards that in your mind you're like, oh, yes, good, I got these. Um, you should be thinking instead, oh, wow, I got a friendly bartender. Oh, wow, I got a friendly Tus uh, sorry, a Tuscar Fisherman. I don't know, he looks friendly too. Um, and, and if you played Arena during that time, you realize it, because that's what the, the cards you see. Uh, and you saw them often, and especially as you get higher up in the win rates, you saw them everywhere, because these were the cards that were winning. Here's the new card. This is KNC for you. This is not the main point of KNC, but this is where we should start. Plated Beetle, 2 mana, 2, 3 beast, death rattle, gain 3 armor. It's good. It's better than your neutral 2, 3. It's guaranteed 3 health, 3 armor because um, it's going to die no matter when you play it, whether it's turn two or later. Uh, and so uh, that's the card. And the point is that that's it. That's all the two drops you get. So take a good look, because they're going away. And instead of all these two drops, what Blizzard has been doing by not printing these two drops is they're printing three drops. And when they're printing three drops, they're printing them better and better. Oh, one more point, just to go back. Um, Friendly Bartender, Tuscar Fisherman, and Play to Beetle, by the way, are all two threes. So just to point that out. Um, right now, three twos are better than two threes because how the meta is shaken out with so many three threes. And as you'll see, also four threes in the meta, so that your three two will take care of it while your two three can't. They are printing a lot of two threes. So at some point, just the sheer number of two threes may overwhelm uh, four threes. Anyway, three drops. In MSG, power creeping on the three drops for the first time, you had a higher gun and you also had a, a toxic sewer ooze. But the idea of having a normally statted on curve minion and then just to give it taunt for nothing was just a stupid idea. Um, like, it was so powerful. 
And it still is so powerful, even though it's been outclassed. And what's it been outclassed by? Ungoro happen, and you get a giant wasp. It's like literally like your opponents can't kill it, it can kill anything. That's ridiculous for just three mana's worth of value. And these were cards like Giant Wasp is right now valued at like a 140 or something on our tier list. Higher gun is a 123. Um Ungoro also had like Tar Creeper, which is a 120 right now. Before that, your best card was like, I don't know, like Earth Ring Farseer, right? That was like one of your best three drops. That's a 115. Um I don't know what else was good. There's no more 3-4s. Those were prior expansions that are no longer here. Like MCT, right? That was one of your best 3-drops. That's a 113 right now. Like, there's been such power creep on 3-drops. Uh, you look at KFT. This may not be better than a Giant Wasp necessarily, but on curve it is. So, this is the best 3-drop curve card that exists in the game right now. So Giant Wasp later on can kill a big thing, but Hildnir Frost Rider will kill a thing and still deal 4 damage to the next thing on curve. Um, and so this three drop, and not only are they printing uh, a lot of the uh, these very powerful three drops, so that their values, which had been like markedly below two drops and four drops, their values are now better than both two drops and four drops in a weird turn of events. But on top of that, they're printing so many of them. Remember how we said there was one two drop in MSG? There was one two drop in uh in uh, K, uh, kfc and there's one two drop in knc well there were three three drops in uh in msg there were 7.5 in angoro but angoro was a very curve heavy kind of expansion it was curve heavy and removal heavy it was like very like bipolar in that sense uh, but then we went back to five in kft which is already a lot right like five is a good number and in K and C, in Kabolds and Catacombs, we have 7.5. The 0.5 is an epic. We count epics at 0.5 because they're offered half as often. That is a ton of 3-drops. And with that many 3-drops, it will really affect the curve. And I'll go into how it affects the curve later. For now, I'm just going to run over what 3-drops you're going to see. Um, and like I said, these are not just a lot of 3-drops, and they're not just really good 3-drops. They're both really insanely good cards, period, that, like, top the value sheet. Like, a Wasp is almost as good as a Bone Mare, you know, almost as good as a Primordial Drake. Like, that's how good these cards are. And Kobolds and Catacombs ups that one more level, one more step. Because as we've seen, there's been one card that kind of pretty much dominates the meta every single time, right? Uh, especially in the most recent expansions, that you just don't know why Blizzard printed them. They're just overstated. They just uh, way better than the other neutral cards, and everyone complains about them. And I don't know if people are complaining about this card yet, but this is going to be insane and more insane than what we've had before. So you had Primordial Drake, then you had Bone Mare, and those are kind of the two defining elements of a meta, right? Primordial Drake, destroy everything on the board, then taunt up. End of aggro. Bone Mare building on aggro, or like really fast mid-range. You need a board, then you buff it really big, and you can go face because the really big thing has taunt, right? Like very clear play styles being set out. In Kobolds and Catacombs, I introduce you to the Stone Skin Basilisk. This is a card, and I don't know what the exact value is right now, but I can tell you without a doubt that it will be higher than Primordial Drake. It will be higher than Bone Mare. Once the Lifeforge tier list is done, um, sometime late Wednesday night, because we've already valued this card, and it is not a terribly difficult card. It just combines some concepts that we've seen before, like Poisonous and Divine Shield, um, without doing anything terribly new. But it's absolutely insane. So we're going to look at it from three perspectives, right? So first, look at it as on curve. Three drop on curve. What happens to the minion across from the other three drop? Well, it kills it. Oh, but it can be pain. Sure, it kills it anyway. So at worst, you're trading with anything that comes. What if your opponent has a bunch of small minions, right? Like the reason why, uh, for example, uh, Cobra is not the most insane thing in the world, it's pretty insane still, is because on turn three, a Raptor would trade with it, right? A two drop can trade up to it. Well, a two drop's not going to trade up with this. You need something like a Balfin Tidehunter to trade up to a Stone Skin Basilisk. 
Normally, if you have a 2-3 or a 3-2, it'll still only hit it once, and the Stone Basculus will still kill the 3-drop afterwards, so it will actually trade up on curve. The big remember back in when we were talking about um, when we were talking about frost riders and when we were talking about wasps. Wasps are better in the late game. Frost riders are better on curve because it'll kill something and still live. Stone skin basilisks are insanely good both in the late game when it will kill really big things for only three mana, and on curve when it will kill something and survive to kill the next thing. So. <laughs> This valuation right now, and I don't know if it's going to end up like this, but it's currently being valued in our system at over a 200. That's right, over a 200. Most classes don't even have a single card over 200 uh, in, in its uh, common and rare slots. And here, a neutral card is going to be over 200. For the record, Primordial Drake right now is around a 160, and Bone Mare is around a 150. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't really know what to think about this card or why they made this card, besides that it's probably not the most ridiculous thing when it comes to Constructed. But in Arena, this is a must-pick. Every time you see it, I don't care if you have class cards competing against it, you are going to pick it, and it is going to ruin your opponent's lives. Okay. So... Even if you just have one card, right? Like, as good as the Basilisk is, it's not going to define an entire curve. You're only going to be offered this card. It's a neutral card. It doesn't have the class bonus. Uh, you're going to be offered this card, like, maybe one per draft. Maybe not even one per draft. Probably less than one of these cards per draft. Maybe even just half per draft. But... In order for the three curve to really be a three drop curve, you need more three drops. And like I said before, we have 7.5 three drops in Cabal's and Catacombs. And while a couple of them are less than stellar, a lot of them are also good. So we're talking like higher gun with Toxic Suru's combo, like Giant Wasp with Tar Creeper in the same set, uh, and Egg Napper. Like, this is where the three drops are going. So. These next three cards are not anywhere near as good as a Basilisk. Remember, Basilisk rated 200. And uh, 200, by the way, is uh, the the scoring on the Lightforge tier list is uh, linear. So it's centered on 100 always, which is the average card, the average random card. The average card in your deck is usually around like a 115 or something. Um, a Basilisk is literally worth the value of two cards. So you would rather like discard a card and play a basilisk and that is like a, a normal regular average card like that's how that's how ridiculously oversatted it is you can add something that just discards one of your cards and it's fine um it's not as good as something like ultimate infestation but but it's it's getting there okay anyway these cards are just normal premium cards they're like your i don't know death speakers right or your egg nappers they're premium. You want them. You're going to take them. They're your Tar Creepers. They're your Higher Guns. They're your Toxic Sewer Ooze. Um, so they'll, they'll fill out the rest of your deck quite handily. And make sure that because they're so good, you're going to end up drafting a lot of threes. Like, no one in this expansion is going to be hurting for a three drop, and the curve is going to start on three. So Dragon Slayer deals six damage to a dragon. Void Ripper, basically a kooky chemist. Um, swaps all the minions. But... It's not really, like, you don't really want to swap all the minions, necessarily. Usually, you have, like, a target that you want to swap their stats. And the rest of it, like, kind of sometimes gets in the way. Sometimes it helps. Um, so I don't value this very differently than if it just had a single target. And Lone Champion, which can be a 2-4 taunt with, uh, with Divine Shield if it happens on curve. Um, or if you can trade off your entire board afterwards. Or if you're behind. So just very flexible cards. And that's not all. Those are just the premium cards. All of these are premium three drops. Like, I'm emphasizing this a lot and spending a lot of time on this to try to emphasize the big difference between, like, two drops that are just, like, kind of okay and are ridiculous because you have to pick all of them just to have enough twos so that you're not hero-powering on turn two. And three drops, which 
are just insane value that they're almost four drops already and you're just going to take all of them especially in this expansion um and whatever you need this is arena right sometimes you don't get the premium cards these are also good nice average three drops toothy chest uh, basically a 4-4 sometimes. Sometimes it's a very hurt thing, but it still has 4 attack. It works on curve. Uh, later on, if you don't have the board, it doesn't do anything, but it's kind of a dead card. But uh, if you do have the board, it's still a 4-4. Fungal Enchanter, healing everything. Um, has, a, has a very good effect, even though it doesn't do much on curve. It's still a, a overall good 3-mana card that you will take, and so you will have a 3-drop. Because if you do get this on turn 3 and you don't have another 3-drop to play, you'll still play it. And uh, Shrieking Shroom which uh it can it can run away with the, it can run away and win you the game but more likely it'll trade okay on turn three or it'll give your lead a decent snowball potential so these are your three drops there are like we covered seven of them it's that good the only one we didn't cover is basically a razor fen hunter uh and and you're gonna you're gonna see them everywhere so welcome to the three drop dominance what does a three drop dominance mean, right? Like if we have all of these cards and if everyone is taking all the basilisks and all the dragon slayers and all the void rippers and all the lone champions, what does that mean for this meta? What it means is that when you don't have enough twos and you have a lot of threes, you take a huge risk trying to go for the two curve by going down in value. Like normally what you do is you, you know, let's say you only have like two two drops and it's like your last like six, seven picks, you start taking more twos, like all the twos you can get. Now, maybe you just kind of give up on it. Why? Because if you have a coin and you have all these threes already, right? Like if we're expecting like six, seven, three drops per deck here, uh, just because of all these neutrals. What you're going to do is you're going to coin three into three which means you skip two, and then two just becomes this like awkward card that's like, especially these two mana minions, right? These two threes, you don't want these in the late game. They, they're really, really bad in the late game. And instead what you would do is you would want to draft more ones because ones, even when you have the coin, can be played like as a bonus, right? You play it a one mana on turn one and then you coin out your threes and you're kind of curving out ahead and you're getting the benefits of being able to dictate trades. Um, on top of that, like on top of the just the odds, right? If you're not going to curve out on two anyway, why not just curve out on three? And then a one drop kind of fills in for a two drop anyway sometimes. Because three drops are the other side of the coin of being so many three drops that you'll have threes anyway, so you're going to always coin three to threes rather than try to coin two to two, which makes twos less useful. Because threes are so insanely good, having a two three doesn't really do much to any of these three drops. And if it doesn't do much to these three drops, then the two drops, like the values just get worse. A two, most of a two drops value is what happens when you play it on curve. That's why you want two drops in the first place. So because threes are so much higher, like just to do a comparison, if you look at the six highest two drop, it's a Sun Fairy Protector at 116. If you look at the six highest uh, three drop, Right now, before all these cards, it's a Tar Creeper at 120. After you put all these cards in, it's probably going to be like a 125. And if you look at a, the number 6 4 drop uh, currently on the tier list, it's a Saranite Chain Gang, again at 116. So the 2 drops and the 4 drops are kind of equally valued, and then 3 drops are just insanely high. So why wouldn't you just take more 3 drops, right? So you're being forced to take more 3 drops, and that means you take less 2 drops. All right. Don't want to beat that uh, more to death uh, than uh, than it already has been. Um, so this is the three drop meta, more so than anyone else, and it's been building, like I said. So maybe the next expansion they can release even more three drops. This is just what Blizzard's doing. They see design space in three drops, and two drops are out. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about are taunts and heals. Uh, metas go fast, they go slow. The easiest way to slow down a meta is to either create a lot of taunts or to create a lot of removals. Because removals remove something that can't hit your face. So it does better than a taunt, right? Especially a double-sided board clear. That really makes sure no one goes aggro. Uh, so not only do we actually get a couple double-sided board clears in this expansion, uh, more importantly, we get a good amount of taunts. If you're looking to see uh, how many taunts we get, here are the numbers. Ungoro had seven, and that was a pretty taunt-heavy meta. KFT only had three, 
because that was not a taunt meta, rather. That was a put stuff on the board and buff it meta. Cabals and Catacombs were back to a taunt meta. There are eight taunts, which is even higher than Angoro. And Angoro is still in the set, right? Like, Angoro broke records. Well, not really. Like, Old Gods was almost as good in terms of having taunts as Angoro. But Angoro definitely broke records at having really, really good taunts that everyone wanted on the neutral slots, right? Like, we talk about Tar Creeper a lot. Um, um, but yeah, you also have your Primordial Drakes. Um, just a lot of taunts. For, for KNC, the same thing is kind of happening. So... It has a ton of taunts, and they're all pretty good. Let's uh, let's start with uh, play to beat uh, play to beetle. This may not be a taunt, but it is a heal. It will slow the game down. We saw this already. That's a two drop. Now we're at a three drop. Lone champion. We talked about it. This taunts. There's another card called Fungal Enchanter, right? Which heals. We went over that card too. So we have a taunt and a heal on three. Shroom Brewer. 4 mana 4-4, four, four. heals. Trog Gloom Eater, taunt. It's a good taunt, too. It's a poisonous taunt. So you think we're done with the curve? No, Hungry Etten, 6 mana, 4-10. It's a 10 health taunt. And if you want even bigger, they added a Sleepy Dragon, which is not great stat-wise, but it'll certainly slow you down, right? Uh, it's no Mastodon, uh, but it does have more health. So there's a lot of things happening in this expansion to kind of slow down the game. Um, and the way it's slowing it down is usually through taunts, right? There's no there's no double-sided board clears in neutrals. Like, there's also no real removals in neutrals either. And we're going to see how important those elements become uh, when it comes to what the meta is really about. Like I said, we're just setting up the meta right now. The void and fun is really where this meta is going to head. Uh, so... What happens when you taunt, right? First, you can't go face. Uh, a taunt protects your board some of the time, depending on how the stats come out. But a taunt always, 100% of the time, causes your opponent not to go face. And healing makes it so that even if your opponent successfully went face for a while, you can recover, heal your face, and get out of lethal range. So this is pretty good, like the combination of the two is pretty good. Like, if you just have taunts, at a certain point, your taunts get destroyed and you die immediately, or they've already gotten enough damage in, and they just, like, fireball you to the face and you die. But having this combination of healing and taunts really allows the game to be slowed down and to be on the board. Um, to have really, really messy boards. I don't know if people remember how messy the boards got in, like, let's say, Old Gods. Old Gods had a taunt meta, and not a lot of... This was before 7.1, this was before the spells offering bonus, the weapons offering bonus. You just had, like, a lot of minions, and it just kind of stalled because there were so many taunts. That's where this is. That's where this meta is headed. Um, because... Okay. So we'll, we'll, now we're going to head into, I guess, like, the thesis of this video. This is where... This is how this meta is going to be different than other metas. And I, I want to set this up, like we, we've set up the all the uh, we've seen a whole bunch of neutral cards, right? Those are generally your your better neutral cards, and uh, and we've seen them, and we know what they do. Um, they curve out on three, and then they taunt and heal, right? So a lot of really powerful three drops taunt and heal. The story I'm going to tell now is the story of how skill gets applied in the arena. So. We're going to start here with Fireplume Phoenix, which is an Angoro card. And we're going to look at how skill was applied in Angoro. 4 mana, 3-3, three, three, deal 2 damage. There were a lot of these cards in Angoro. Cards with initiative. Neutral cards with initiative. Uh, obviously, a lot of class cards like removals have initiative. But neutral cards usually don't have initiative. There's usually maybe one or two cards with initiative. But Angoro added a whole lot of neutral cards with initiative. Fireplume Phoenix, and they're good cards too, so you'll draft them. And they have offering on bonuses, so you'll draft them. Fireplume Phoenix, Glacial Shard, Devil Soar, Primordial Drake, and Blazecaller, back when there were a lot more elementals. So when you have a lot of initiative, that means you can deal with a lot of threats like as they come. You can react. You don't have to predict what your opponent's doing exactly. You just have to know that, oh, my opponent did something, I don't like it, I'm going to use my removal now. 
and it came at the same time as the spell bonus offering rate in the arena. So there were just a lot of removals everywhere. You can deal with any threat that gets put out. So it was hard to snowball. You had a lot of taunts also to go with it. And the game became very much rock, paper, scissors, right? Like, I have a threat. Do you have an answer? Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to play another threat. Do you have another answer? Oh, you're going to play a threat. Well, do I have an answer? Because that's what cards with initiative do. It becomes a threat and answer meta. And that was, not coincidentally, our theme for Ungoro when we were talking about it. KFT in the preview was reward the board. Ungoro was threat and answer. Um, and threat and answer metas typically devolve into these like rock, paper, scissor type metas, which was even a bigger problem in MSG, but I'm not going to go too, uh, too, back, uh, too far back into MSG. But it basically means that the game you have with your opponent is pretty much decided before you actually enter the match based on what kind of decks you brought to the match. For example, if I brought an aggro deck and you had two Primordial Drakes, I've lost. That just happens, right? If you have more answers and I have less threats, I've lost. So the quality of the deck becomes very important. Uh, it's not that there's no skill involved, but the skill kind of like caps out at a much lower place than other styles. Um, and also, it, similarly, it means drafting becomes more important. So the skill in drafting becomes uh, a, a higher like threshold. Um, constructed is a lot like this because it has a ton of responses, right? If you can if you can make the deck, you're going to take all the removals and things like that. And they're also the ones most highly rated on any tier list you see for that exact reason. So that's an area where I think, at least in the arena, the skill gets lowered when it comes to the actual gameplay. And the skill may get more when it comes to uh, drafting your deck. Next, we're going to move on to KFT, which again was very different. KFT was reward the board, and a good card to show that was Bone Mare. It's not like there's been no buffs, but there's a lot of buffs in KFT and neutral, and they're all very good. Like, we keep getting to this theme, right? Like, lots of buffs very good. It's not just Bone Mare. It's also Fallen Sun Cleric, Atreus Veteran. It's um, Death Speaker. It's uh, Corpse Razor. Like... The board was rewarded. You were rewarded for having a board. But Bone Mare was the biggest culprit in this meta. And so now you're thinking, oh, okay, so is this a better or worse meta? Do I have more skill or less skill? You have a little bit more skill because you still have initiative, right? You can still respond to things. But in order to respond to things, you need to have a board. So now everyone's fighting for the board. And Again, they didn't print all that many two drops because the curve kind of died also in uh, in KFT. Or for some classes, the curve died. There were class two drops. Um, it was a, it was a little mixed. Uh, so now you do have initiative coming from Bone Mare, right? Bone Mare adds four attack to the board that you can use immediately as long as you have some uh, like a buff target that's already existing on the board before this turn started. But now it's conditional. It's conditional on you already being good enough to have the board. So it's kind of a mixed meta. Um, it rewards not necessarily good drafters because everyone's trying to do a very similar thing in KFT. So the drafting skill level go go goes down quite a bit, but it rewards very good technical board players and players who are good at knowing how to use the coin in the early turns to get the board so that they can snowball off of it. Um, and if you're looking at how the game goes, it was more controlly in Angoro because of all these taunts and because of all these double-sided board clears and because of all this initiative and threat response, right? If you can always respond to things, you can play control. That's kind of the definition of control, right? Your opponent does stuff and you more efficiently remove them. In KFT, it balances back because now you're aggressive. Why are you aggressive? You're aggressive at least on the board. You may not want to hit your opponent's face, but you want to preserve the board because you need stuff on the board to get value out of all these neutral cards. And again, this is all being driven by neutral, neutral cards. So what does Cabal and Catacombs do to this? We're back to the back, a Basilisk. And what does the Basilisk do? You may be thinking, oh, um, Fire Plume deals two damage. Bone Mare buffs for four. What does this do? What, what, what's happening here? And the answer is, it does nothing. There are zero, it's not true, there's one card. There's exactly one card 
that buffs your board in the entire neutral category in Kabuls and Catacombs. One card. There are no cards that charge. There are no cards that deal damage. This is the first set that has ever been released, large sets, in which those two factors are true. Every single other set did more stuff initiative-wise. We are entering, assuming there's a, a card offering bonus here, uh, like a set offering bonus that's commiserate with what we're used to, rather than like the KFT, like, oh, we're just not going to, we're like, we have an offering bonus, but we're going to tell you it's 100%, it's actually 50%. But regardless, we are adding a lot of cards into the card pool. They are going to get some kind of offering bonus, and they don't do anything. When you play this card, nothing happens. Even if you taunt, nothing happens on this turn. You may be limiting your opponent, but your opponent still has the initiative. And you get the initiative the next turn. Why? Because your opponent can't remove your stuff. Like, do we see what's happening? Rather than being able to... Compare this to Angoro, right? Rather than being able to play something to respond to your opponent, you can't do that anymore. All of your spells are at a premium. You don't have that many... Like, the other thing that's happening here is the class cards also don't add a lot of initiative. Warrior and Rogue have no initiative added in the arena, effectively. They have really bad cards that have initiative, which don't really count. And most of the other classes have only one initiative card added, like one removal added. That's a very low percentage. That's going to dilute the pool. So you may look at, let's say, a class like Shaman and, um, and see um, their card, which I don't have here, uh, but it's a... It's a Two mana, deal eight damage, uh, overload for three card, and think, oh, it's a great removal for Shaman. Sure, and you're going to pick it every time. But even still, Shamans are going to have fewer removals than they had before. Why? Just because they used to have more removals, and now they only get one out of a total of eight cards. And without the neutral card pool backing up the removals, right? Like... Without your Fire Plume Phoenixes, without your Bomb Squads, without your Bone Mares, without your Primordial Drakes, you don't have the ability to answer your opponent's threats on the turn they're played. So snowballing becomes better. Just cards that like you know do something at the end of every turn. For example, like a Scalebane. You're going to hate Scalebane more. I think that's one of the reasons why they printed uh, the Dragon Slayer card. Because uh, your <laughs> your cobalt skill base are going to get a little ridiculous in this upcoming expansion, <laughs> if they weren't ridiculous already. But more importantly, what this means is you have to anticipate what your opponent is going to play the next turn. Because if all you're doing is your opponent plays a card, you play a card, your opponent does something first, and then you look to use your initiative. That's very slow, and that's not very good. Instead, if you control the board as a good technical player, CKFT should be able to do, your opponent drops something, you should already have the minion that can best respond to what your opponent's about to drop in play. Now, Basilisk is uh, kind of a, a easy, you know, Swiss Army knife of it'll be good against anything. But for your other cards, for every single turn, you have to think, what can my opponents play the next turn? What are the cards he might have? What are the class cards? What are the bombs? And I need to play based on that. Because you don't want to play into the Flame Strike. Because even though all your cards are just minions and you kind of have to do stuff. And on top of that, you like you don't want to play into the 5-5 five five on turn 5. Just as like a really like throwaway kind of example that you'll meet in every single game. If you're turn 4, your opponent's about to play, and you have the choice between like a 3-5 and a 5-4... You need to play the 5-4. Why? Because your opponent is about to play the 5-5. Much more likely than they're going to play anything that your 3-5 is going to match up with. And then if you play the 5-4, your opponent doesn't play the 5-5. Instead, let's say he plays a 3-drop and a 2-drop. Then, if you have a taunt, for example, to protect your 5-4, now you're getting somewhere, right? Like, you see the board interaction that Arena does so well. So, this is what this new meta is going to be about. I call it the unfun meta. And I call it the unfun meta because if you've been listening all the way up to this point and you think, wow, this is going to be so fun, you are in like the 1%, like the bottom 1% along with me of people who think that this stuff is fun. This is going to be a slog. This is going to be a slow, painful slog 
of putting minions on the board, of thinking really hard about what your opponent may or may not play, of doing technical trades on the board, because remember, KFT's still in, and then of every now and then, because there's a lot of RNG in this set, and because Angoro is still a set, just getting your opponent all your work, all the minute, like, you know, the, the little bits that have been, the advantages that you've built up, completely wiped away by, like, a psychic screen, for example. That's what this meta is. It is very skill-based until it's not. So it is probably the definition of unfun. Unless, unless you really care about the technical stuff and you're okay with the RNG. And I think I kind of fit into that category. Uh, so I'm actually overall really excited about this meta. And I had a lot of doubts. If you guys listened to the Lifeforge podcast even like days ago, right? The, the previous one, 122. Um, I was I was not very excited about this uh, expansion. But now I am. Because all of these neutral cards do nothing. It's beautiful. They're all good. Or they're not all good. But a lot of them are very good. So you're going to pick them. But they don't do anything to turn their played. And this absolute lack of initiative is so refreshing. It is just, it's back to the basics, right? Like Dungeons and Dragons. Just put your stuff out there. Um, and there's another good effect to having um, all of your neutral cards be really more neutral and really do less uh, while being good cards. Um, and we'll get to that uh, to close this off for Class Divergence. Uh, for now, we'll talk about the downside. I feel like I don't want to be too positive about this expansion, and then people play, and they're like, Oh, Adwukta, you said this was not going to be fun, but it was going to be technical and reward skill, and all this stuff is happening, and I'm not doing anything. Okay. So, let's talk about RNG. This is kind of the elephant in the room with the Cabals and Catacombs set, and really with any set that's going to try to, you know, capture the spirit of Dungeons and Dragons, where you are literally, like, rolling dice. There's a lot of RNG. There is. But, there is actually not as much RNG as you may think. Because, and as we've been putting these cards in and finding the values to these cards, I think especially when you look at uh, the Lightforge uh, tier list on Thursday, you'll see the mass majority of cards with any amount of randomness in it are not good. Like, they could be okay. They could be like a round of 100 or like a 90-something, but they're not good. Like the poster boy for pure RNG, right? You know what? I'm going to skip ahead. I had something else planned to say here, but I'm going to skip ahead to pure RNG. The poster child for pure RNG is Guild Recruiter. Because it is the recruit mechanic that for Constructed does all these weird things, but for Arena it's just pure randomness, right? Like you take a minion from your deck and you put it out here. What? Um, it is a 92 right now. And again, these scores will all change. We haven't scaled it. Uh, we haven't like rescaled it and recentered the uh, the tier list yet. Uh, but what it means is it's probably going to be below average. I'm almost certain this card's going to be below average. And I said it when I first looked at this card. So are you going to have it? Yes, sometimes. 92 is not a card you would never pick. It's just a below average card. You're going to be forced to pick it sometimes. And when you pick it, you may be screwed. You're expecting something along the lines of a 3-3. You may get a 4-5, which is great. Or you may get a 1-1, which is horrible. But even if you get a 1-1, that's just minus 2. That's just minus 2 tempo. And minus two tempo is not something you can't come uh, come back from. Minus two tempo. Here's what I I, I, I want to think about it this way: the value of a innervate before it was nerfed was two tempo. That's a normal thing to lose. In the same way, the value of getting a, an extra card, right? Your opponent just gaining an extra card on you. For example, their loot hoarder trading into your raptor, or their polluted loot hoarder, like polluted hoarder, trading into your 4-4 or whatever, right? Like, they have an extra card now and you're even on tempo. In this case, you lose 2 tempo. Or, you have a 2-2, your opponent has a 2-3, they eat your 2-2, and now they have 2 more tempo on the board. These are never the end of the game. You will sometimes lose games because of it, but these are like edging out your opponent, right? Like this is exactly the kind of technical, like board, like the result of like technical board play with some RNG and some top deck luck and all that stuff mixed in. That is a part of this like inching along on the skill spectrum, right? Um, 
Something that we talked about on, on a, a prior Light Forge is that the more that nothing happens in an expansion, the more these little bits of advantages that you kind of build up matter. So back in Classic, when there was very little going on, like a lot of neutral minions, there was no spell bonus, offering bonus. It was just a lot of like yetis and, you know, crocs and all that stuff. Very, very technical on the board advantages were will one you and lost you the game people would analyze endlessly on it trump like was one of the top arena players for doing not much more than just very excellent board analysis and good drafting and not fancy drafting not like you know going for synergies but his main principle and that's how uh you know that's one of uh, my early teachers of of arena was just that Yeti is actually one of the best cards in the arena. He was one of the first people who, if not the first person, who really recognized that, and he made a tier list with it. Um, and it was like that because Yeti's allows you to get that advantage, and that advantage carries you over on the board, and it will eventually win you the game. Like, when you lost a card back then, it was a big deal, right? When, like, they ate one of your minions, that was a big deal because they got the tempo. Now, today, it's not that big of a deal. Because you have Angoro, because if you ever get the board, you have KFT. You have all these big swings that will actually let you potentially get back on the board. So this RNG is at once not crippling, and two, you have ways to come back from it. Now, do you want RNG to be determining that rather than your skill? You don't. You would much prefer it be to your skill. So I'm not saying these are good cards, but the impact is low, right? The number of times you're going to see this card is low. And the number of times that this card is going to then either very negatively impact you or very positively impact you is also kind of low. It's mostly going to give you around a 3-drop. Or like, you know, a 3-2. Or like, you know, maybe a 4-4. Four, four. Like, nothing crazy. And the times in which it will actually give you something crazy, like a 1-1 one, one, or like an extra card or something is still within the bounds of what is acceptable in this new kind of like game with the new amount of variants that Angoro and KFT has introduced. So I don't think, like bottom line, I don't think Kabuls and Catacombs is actually expanding the universe of swings. Which is what it seemed like when the first reveals were, were coming in. But because... The board is so stabilized by the neutral minions, the amount of swings is really just matching, if not lowering, if not diluting the amount of swings. Because you look at the other swing cards, right? Like, what are they? Like, here, here are some of the other swing cards. These are these are some, like, on-the-board tempo swings of just, like, putting minions out, right? Like, Spiteful Summoner. Uh, six mana, four, four, battle cry, reveal a spell from your deck, summon a random minion with the same cost. Could be a ten mana minion, could be a one mana minion, right? Like, huge swing. Epic minion. You're not going to see it too often. Valdori Strider, right? Possessed Lackey. Those are just class cards. Yes, they could cause big swings. Sometimes. Not even always. Just sometimes. So you have to first have the card in your opponent's deck or in your deck. Then you have to draw it. Then you have to play it. Then you have to hit the RNG. And these are like epic cards. Or Possessed Lackey, I guess, is a rare card. But it's not like a card that people are going to pick too frequently because you need a big demon to like actually make it work. And that's it. Like, I'm not even, like, cherry-picking here. I'm actually picking all the cards that I think are average-ish and showing them to you. And, and these are all the actual RNG cards. Like, I'm going to repeat that again because it seems weird because everyone keeps talking about RNG. Of the playable, like, higher than 90 value cards, it's just those four. Nothing else has greater than a plus or minus two tempo or plus or minus one card draw swing that is based purely on RNG in this entire expansion. Now, a lot of cards have a little RNG and a lot of bad cards have a lot of RNG, but you're just not going to see them that frequently in the arena. Compared to a almost no RNG set like KFT, uh, there's going to be more RNG. You know, Angoro also did not have all that much RNG. Those are very non-RNG sets. So compared to them, this set will have more RNG. But compared to MSG or anything before that, 
this is not like this is not the next coming of GVG basically, which is kind of the way it's been marketed. Unfortunately, um, I guess people like fun and they don't like the reality of what the set's going to bring, or at least Blizzard thinks they won't like it. And I think Blizzard's right; they probably won't like it. We are now entering the unfun meta with dashes of RNG to keep things interesting. So again, think of it as Dungeons and Dragons, right? Like, and this is kind of how Arena is anyway. Sometimes you're gonna get unlucky and you're gonna have to try to fight your way back from like a two temple deficit or from like a one card down place. Those just happens, bad luck happens. And this deck, this expansion doesn't increase it, I think, to an unacceptable degree or even a degree to which we haven't seen before. It doesn't even bring us back to MSG levels of RNG. Now, what it does kind of do and this could be potentially problematic, is it swings a lot. So, Cataclysm is a card. Here is one more addition to the clear the entire board idea. Psychic Scream, clear the entire board. Dragon's Fury, RNG, maybe clear the entire board. And I'll tell you right now, Psychic Scream and Cataclysm are both super premium cards. They're, like, better than Primordial Drake. Why? Because they clear the whole entire freaking board. They'll reset this, uh, the slate. But they're both epics. And one is seven mana, so it's not like the Priest is going to play anything. So it's a pure, like, card advantage kind of, like, gambit. And Cataclysm forces the Warlock to discard everything. So it's either a really fast Warlock that has to hurt itself to get a board back, or... Uh, it's a normal Warlock, and Cataclysm is played very late, then you Hero Power, and then you have four more mana, and hopefully you draw something that you can play. Which is kind of like Psychic Stream in, the, in that sense when you do that. So there are ways to play around both of these. Not like not like play around as in like dodge it, um, but play around as in make sure that you either have enough cards left that the Psychic Stream or the Cataclysm won't destroy you card advantage left, or deal enough damage. Like, usually for Warlock, your goal is to deal enough damage that after the Cataclysm, they can't hero power too much. And so, you know, you just win afterwards. And for Psychic Scream, it's the exact opposite, right? You need to preserve enough card advantage because the Priest can always heal himself. So once they Psychic Scream, you can't be like, oh, I have no more cards. I guess your two card advantage wins the game. Um, this is kind of like Death Knights, right? And I know people hate Death Knights. And these are actually valued, like, around where Death Knights are. Uh, so I know people are going to hate these. Um, but they're things you can play around. And they're class cards. They're not neutral cards. And this is a really, 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 really big deal. Because if you're playing a priest right now, what do you need to do? You need to make sure you always have enough card advantage while trying to fight for the board. Is it harder? Yes. But it's acceptable. With Warlock, you always knew that Warlocks can hugely board clear everything. That's always been a thing. Right? Like, they've had Doom, they have Twisting Nether. This is nothing new. You're playing around the Warlock the same way. And with Psychic Scream, right? Dragonfire Potion's also there. So you're not really adding anything too new. You're just creating the consistency of it. And they're forcing you to do certain things against certain enemies, right? Um, and this is going to tie into our next theme, the Class Divergence part. So I don't really mind these things. Dragon's Fury, obviously, way too random. I mind, and yes, it is going to be an above-average card. And yes, we're all going to hate this card, but again, epic. Um, but this is the real problem with, with KNC, right? This is the biggest issue. This is the downside out of all the praise I've been uh, lavishing on Kobolds and Catacombs in the arena, uh, in the arena meta that's about to come. Um, there will be these big swings, and you will have to be in a position. You will have to keep yourself in a position where you can win even if these things happen until you get to the desperation meter which if you listen to lifeforge podcast you know more details about what that is uh and you hit the point where you're like well if they have that card we just lose so they don't have that card and so we're just gonna play as if they don't have it um so again i think it's a good mix right of technical on the board play and then that desperation meter switch it hasn't pushed it too towards the desperation meter switch uh, and finally, uh, there's more, like, you know, swings. Like, it's not just... The most clear swing is the giant board clear, right? But here are tempo swings. Corridor Creeper uh, is going to be an absolutely insane car. I, I, we haven't valued it yet, but it's going to be, like, I, I want to say 150 or more. That's just a guess. 
Just because if you think about it, it costs one less whenever a minion dies with this in your hand. How many minions die per turn in the arena? Two? Three? It doesn't have to be your minions, just like any minions. Um, so this is going to like be discounted two or three mana every turn. It's going to be free if you just hold it in your hand for like two or three turns. And it's a 5-5. Five, five. Like just a free 5-5 five, five on the board. Uh, ridiculous, right? And you have to be prepared to deal with it. And this is like the bat swing, right? You don't want an extra 5-5 five, five on, on, on the board. That's a big swing. That's not like... And this always happens. Right? Every single game that someone has this in their hand, they will get a five tempo swing. This is not like a two tempo swing. This is not the... Uh, uh, this is not the guild recruiter. Right? Arcane Tyrant, not a very good card. It gets a little bit less of a swing and you have to play a five mana or more... Um, uh, when I say not a very good card, I mean not like a super premium card like Corridor Creeper. Um, still, four swing, not good. Carnivorous Cube, um, destroy a friendly minion, summon two copies of it. Again, potentially uh, potentially causing huge swings, but you get a little time to prepare for Carnivorous Cube. So there is that. Um, and most importantly, all epic, right? If they're neutral, they're epic. And they're minions, so they're neutral, epic, minions. You're not going to see too many of these. Like, they're not going to, like, be in every game in your arena experience. But you do have to overcome these. So, yeah, it's a good mix, right? Like, very technical on the skill play. Taunt stop things. You know, everything matters. Not a ton of initiative. And then just a temple bomb now and then. Um, and finally, uh, the spell stones. I don't want to talk too much about them. But these are another form of swing. I'm just showing all the ways that you can actually have these swings uh, in the arena now that weren't possible before, right? Like, there was no Carnivorous Cube before. There was definitely no Corridor Creeper before. This is like Thing from Below, right? That was as close as you got. And you can only Hero Power once per turn. Um, these Spell Stones... I, I, I took these three, and I don't think the other ones really are that bad uh, in that they're not that big of a swing and they're not as good. These are good because... They're very easy to trigger in the arena. Arena has weapons. You just have to equip a weapon to trigger the uh, the warrior spell stones. So you're going to have 7 mana and get uh, two five fives, Or you're going to get three five fives because you could easily have two weapons. That definitely happens. Uh, Lesser Jasper spell stone, your hero power gives you armor. So you always have the option to armor it out. Because remember, you can use your hero power on... The, like after you have two charges built up, you can use your hero power... And then use that on the same turn for one mana deal four damage. So these are these are pretty decent swings. And again, warrior, uh, sorry, uh, well both warrior, but also druid now has uh, has more uh, armor cards. And finally, the hunter one, which is just like a purely on curve five mana, like two three threes. That's a good card. Two three three wolves for five mana. I'd pick it and play it. I wouldn't say it's premium if that's all it did, but it's pretty good. Um, and if you play a secret at any time, right, and Hunter secrets are good in the arena. They're the only secrets that are good. I know people like taking mage secrets and pretending that they're good, but they're not good. Um, so you take your good secrets, like the Venom Strike or like the Snake Trap or like the Freezing Trap or like whatever, and then you happen to play one of them and all of a sudden you get an extra 3-3 Wolf. So these swings are going to happen, but they're very specific. And I have pretty much showed you all of them. I think that's the like take home message here right like i have showed you all the swings and they're almost all epic or they're in one particular class and so if it happens it happens once per game and you'll probably have it happen to you too once per game so i, I think it's just the right amount um you don't really want to play a game where it's all yetis and crocs so that's that's the downside of Cabal's and Catacombs, and we'll wrap this up with what it means to have a neutral set that doesn't do anything, right? Like we talked about class dive about class convergence in KFT, where the neutral set was so good, where the neutral set was so good, and it did one thing, which is be on the board and we'll buff you, and we will reward the board that all the classes benefited from playing like that. If not in the very beginning, then to have a time where you flip it and play like that. Uh, and that's a problem, right? Because in KFT, I think a lot of the complaints were, well, all the classes kind of play the same. Like, I don't have to have a special different plan playing against other classes. I have to watch out for a couple cards, like Defile or whatever. But for the most part, what I'm doing is I'm sitting here 
and I am trying to get stuff on the board, and then I'm trying to get rewarded for it by uh, top decking the cards to uh, to be able to buff it. Here, everything's a little different, right? Because if your neutral cards don't have a theme, if they don't do anything, if they don't push you towards any direction, which is great, right? Because it's Dungeons and Dragons, you should be free. And just like Dungeons and Dragons and Cabals and Catacombs, you get to be your class. Mages get to be more like mages. Paladins get to do more paladin things. Why? Because all your initiative, all your card draw, I didn't even say this before, but also neutral cards don't have card draw now in this set. Like the first time ever. Like, you have to rely on your class for everything, for anything fancy you do. So, uh, in addition to the existing class cards, the Cabals and Catacombs class cards also just happen to be really flavorful. Like, some of these aren't even good cards. I'm going to just show you cards that I think are, like, very flavorful, right? Like, uh, Druids, what do they do? They taunt. They were taunting in, KF, uh, in KFT because um, that's what they made Druids do there again, finally. Thank you. Thank you, Blizzard. They'd gone away from taunts for a while in Druid, but now they brought it back. And it's great, and they're adding more to it. Um, they're adding uh, two cards to it. It's not just the Grizzled Guardian, which is going to be an above-average card, uh, but it is also uh, the Golem. Uh, the Golem that can't attack unless you get armor, which I understand is not the best card, but it's actually a playable card, I think. I think it's going to be rated higher than people think. Uh, Cave Hydra, right? With uh, with beasts. There are so many beasts coming in, right? You have Flanking Strike. Uh, you have your Lesser Emerald Spellstone that we looked at before. And you have your Cave Hydra. That's three beast cards. It's pretty good. Um, and then you have Mage. Mage always had a lot of card draw, right? So they have more card draw now. They have this. They have uh, also the Raven. Um, it's just, it's very, it's very good flavor. You have your Paladin with a Crystal Lion. This gives you, not only does it synergize with Silver Hand, uh, Silver Hand Knights that you may recruit, which is also your hero power, which also you have more cards that give you Silver Hand. You also get Divine Shield. And in addition to this card, there's also Potion of Heroism, which is a good card that gives Divine Shield to a minion and draws a card for two mana. Again, more Divine Shield, more Paladin stuff. That's what you should be afraid of from Paladins, and now you are. And the thing with going towards your class is that they're the same things. They haven't, like, taken a class and added a new thing to it. They're only re recycling old things, which means they push the classes more towards their class things. And when you as the player want to play against that class, I'm worried about Divine Shields against Paladin. I'm worried about Taunts when I'm against a Druid. I'm worried about Beasts and clearing every Beast when I'm against uh, Hunters. I'm worried about Mage card draw, so I have to make sure I have some extra cards and card advantage going into the late game if I'm going to get there, right? I can expect big swings from the Priest because they're going to have Dragons and do these kinds of ridiculous Priest things, which again is why Priest is a horrible, horrible class to face against. Um, I'm not saying you're going to like facing against these classes, but you're going to have these different plans again in the same way you did in MSG, in the way that it kind of went away in KFT, right? Angoro was still okay. But in MSG, you really had a distinct and totally different game plan against each and every class. And they brought that back. And they brought that back without saying, oh, you're part of this gang. You just buff your stuff, right? Or you're part of this gang. You just do whole board clears. Instead, each class does their own thing that they've always been doing. And the neutral cards just support everything in a very non-initiative, non-card draw, it is what it is kind of way. It's, uh, it's, a, good, it's a good set. And Warlock, right? Like, what, what does this card not have? It damages yourself, it's a demon, it taunts, and all the other cards for Warlock too, right? Kabul Libra Librarian, Hook Reaver, they both damage yourself, and other cards all either taunt or heal or is a demon. Um, it's all very connected. Um, and these are the times when it works, right? So these are the classes which I think it really works. What Blizzard's trying to do, it really works in the arena. The classes in which it doesn't work... I mean, you can't all have winners, right? Warrior. What do they want to do with Warrior? Well, Armor. Clearly, Armor was one of these this, like, great mechanic in, in, in Constructed. Uh, and it's the reason why Arena Warriors have always kind of sucked. They're leaning more heavily into it. Not only is this guy Armor... And by the way, if people are wondering whether this guy's good, he's not that good. Um, he's fine, but Armor's just not all that important. 
It's more important now than it used to be, but still not all that important. So you're just a two mana two two with like a mediocre kind of bonus. When as a warrior you need curb. Anyway. Uh, it's not just this guy. Unidentified Shield also has armor. Reckless Flurry uses armor. Bladed Gauntlet uses armor. Gem Studded Golem uses armor. So it's a lot of armor mechanics. And, uh, you know, in the arena, armor mechanics are bad. So Warrior's going to be bad. Choose a basic totem. Summon it. Kobold Hermit. Shamans are leaning into totems here, which is great, right? Very flavorful, very much like what shamans do. Um, but again, basic totems, I don't know what they do in Constructed, but they're not that great in the arena. So a lot of the cards associated with it are all going to kind of suck. Uh, and again, these are... What do you know about these two classes? They are the worst two classes in KFT. And they are only getting worse cards. So while going more into your own like class divergence is generally a good thing, definitely a good thing for diversity, it's bad if your own thing is a thing that sucks in the arena, right? Like at least I'm glad for Shaman they didn't push it more towards RNG because RNG was also a Shaman thing. Uh, at least they chose to, to go down the totem route. But yeah, it's just bad cards. Uh, and finally... The one new thing, right? I said there were no new things. I know if you were, if you knew what all the cards were, you were thinking, wait, wait, but one class is totally doing a new thing. They did do new things with one class. It is Rogue. They have secrets now. Just wanted to end on that. Um, secrets are okay. Rogue secrets are not good. I don't know what else to kind of <laughs> say about it. Like, sudden betrayal. When a minion attacks your hero, instead it attacks one of its neighbors. Okay, so your opponent has to have two minions with initiative on the board before this secret will even trigger and do anything. So it's huge tempo delay. And then it will deal probably the smaller amount of damage, right? Because it's attacking your hero, so your opponent can always control when to attack your hero. Um, the other ones, also not terribly good. One gets a card back in your hand, the other one saves you some health. Like... Yeah, they try to do something new with Rogue, but not really. Not because they didn't try, but because these are going to be, like, not good cards and no one's going to pick them in the arena. So, that brings us back to Kobolds and Catacombs. Um, I don't know if there's anything else to, to say about it from a big picture point of view. We've, we've spent an hour on it, as I kind of expected to and wanted to, um, which is great. It is now, God, it is now 2 a.m. Um, and I guess we'll come back to the Basilisk, the one who will rule us all in Kabuls and Catacombs, the card that most decks will draft and most decks will have to try to deal with. So welcome to our new Arena Overlords, the Stone Skim Basilisk. You have outperformed the Bone Mare, the Primordial Drake, all things that look much more scary than you and cost much more mana than you. So congratulations. And uh, for those of you who are watching this and have made it through all the way to the end, I hope you guys are as excited as I am about a boring meta, about a meta devoid of initiative, devoid of card draw, devoid of neutral cards doing way too much stuff. Just building blocks like Legos that you put out and then you can be your mage, you can be your paladin, you can be your warlock or whatever. Uh, and if you are not very excited about this, maybe approach it from a learning way in which this is probably one of the better metas to learn in. Um, KFT really only allows you to learn one thing, which is technical stuff on the board, but this meta lets you learn pretty good things about desperation meter, uh, pretty good things about deck construction. Um, you're going to need to conserve those resources a lot. You're going to need to learn a lot of like higher level thinking stuff in the arena, right? Which is how to deal with each individual class. And most importantly, because everything's just a minion that has no initiative, you're going to need to learn how to predict what your opponent's going to do. And every time you mess up, you know immediately because your opponent immediately punishes you by playing a different minion. Um, as opposed to the answer and response meta, right? Like, are you not going to play your bomb? No, you're going to play your bomb. Oh, he removed it. Are you going to play your next bomb? Yeah, you are. Oh, he removed it. Like, 
I don't know what there is to learn about that. That was more of a drafting exercise. This, uh, so again, drafting exercise is Ungoro, uh, a little bit of rock, paper, scissors. Uh, KFT is technical on the board. Now we're in the flexible predict your opponent uh, kind, of, uh, kind of meta. And the also the recovery meta without the tools to actually recover from, right? Like try to recover from a psychic scream. In order to recover, you have to prepare for it. So I don't know. Maybe it's not the unfun meta. Maybe we should call it something different. Maybe we should call it the preparation meta. You know what? I'm going to name it that. And I'm going to title it that. And if you're wondering why the hell you've watched this entire video up to this point and you have not heard the word preparation be used once, it's because I've just come up with it right now. Welcome to the preparation meta. Uh, once again, as uh, I am Adwikta, usually have Murps here with me, and we are the Grinning Goat together. But uh, but he is he is very busy right now, and we are very short on time. So so I have done this alone for this expansion only. I promise you, Murps will be back for the next expansion. And uh, once again, we are not doing a card by card uh, review for this expansion. Our card by card review will instead be a giant Q and A session on Thursday night and Friday night streams. Uh, we stream at seven o'clock New York time, um, six o'clock New York time on Saturdays and Sunday, or on weekends. We usually don't stream on Saturdays, just Sundays. Uh, but in this expansion, we will be streaming Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and uh, it will be one giant Q and A session on any of the ways we valued any of the cards. Um, Totally welcome your feedback on all the valuations too, because we'll be making some tweaks over the weekend, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, so uh, in case you thought there was a stream Wednesday night tonight, there will not be. There will be Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday and so on. Um, okay, thank you guys for watching and uh, see you in the Kobolds and Catacombs meta.